this is this topic is completely blowing my mind. Um, I'm going to start with some images that um, Corey sent me. I'm sorry, they're behind you. Um, so I know that these are supposed to be organized, but do these ants in particular just not know what they're doing? Well, they know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> are these just like silly ants? Did we just get, what about these guys? Also not silly. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on there? You gave me these videos. I did. So in that first video, what you see are a whole bunch of ants that are cutting up a mango. Mm -hmm. And they're the same um, genus as what you're looking at here on the other slide. Mm -hmm. But what you'll notice is there's these really large headed ones and their heads are filled just with muscles, massive amounts of muscles. So they can cut up giant chunks of this mango. The one on the top, you can see how it's almost like a half moon. That big chunk will come out and they'll carry it back to the nest. So this is a really interesting group of ants. These are the fungus farming ants. Um, and what's interesting is that they don't eat the plant material they're carving up. They take all of that back to the nest because they're actually the world's first farmers. They take all that plant material back and they grow a fungus. And they eat nothing else but this fungus. So these are essentially mushroom farmers and they've been doing this for about 50 million years. <laughs> take that matcha. <laughs> What about these? These are sidewalk ants. Yeah, so this is a really interesting group of ants. It turns out that they're not native to the US, but these are the ants that you see streaming out of the cracks of your sidewalk. They're one of the only ant species that will fight to the death. So you'll have two <laughs> colonies that actually will battle over sort of, you know, property rights. Typical New York sidewalk behavior. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, although this was filmed in Chicago, not that it's much Typical different there. Typical sidewalk Chicago behavior. <laughs> Um, but what we see here is that it's typically like most groups of organisms when they encounter um, uh, battles, they essentially are just sizing up who is the ability to win. They don't actually want to duke it out all the way, but these ants actually will battle to the death where you'll actually see piles of dead ants like from those, um, those uh, interactions, which is pretty unusual. So you, you love dead ants, right? Yeah. <laughs> I do love dead ants. Dead, dead ants are fascinating. Dead ants, dead ants, I didn't mean to do this. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to do that again without me interrupting? <laughs> so I, speaking of dead ants, I heard about this zombie ant experiment where, so ants, when they die, are kind of ignored for a couple of days, is my understanding. And then eventually they emit a kind of acid, an oleic acid, that alerts the other ants that they're dead. So they start to build a graveyard. And, um, and you can take a live ant and coat it with this acid and the ant will be like, I'm dead. And then the other ants will carry it away and it will go to the graveyard. And it'll like hang out in the graveyard, being like, I'm dead. And then, and then when it rubs off, they realize it's time to go back to the hive. Yeah, the one spin on that story is that the ant that's gotten rubbed with oleic acid doesn't know it's dead. Oh, okay. And it fights the whole way, and you oh. dump it in the graveyard, and it tries to run back in, and the other ants still say, you're dead, and they <laughs> take it back out, until it dissipates. So it's like the Monty Python skit, bring out your yeah. dead? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm not dead. I'm not dead. Not dead yet. <laughs> so, so, I mean, in what sense is this hive, in what sense is this swarm behavior? Why do we think of this? as like swarm intelligence. Thank you, God, for the dramatic music. <laughs> that is definitely not our AV guys. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what you say. I don't that. know, where is it coming from? Is it really God? <laughs> Science and spirituality is September 30th. <laughs> uh, this is wild. Is this, is this feedback? No, I think it's the sheep living from the... You're saying it's the cruise ship, but... Oh, is it the Queen Mary too? Bastards. Yeah, so. Simon, <laughs> Simon. Swarm intelligence, right? Talk to me why this is a swarm, because I know you've said it looks totally disorganized on the small scale. It looks totally disorganized on a small scale, right? Like if you look at, I mean, it's the same thing as if you look at Times Square, right? If you look just at the people in Times Square, it looks like a complete mess. And it is to some extent because of all these tourists, French mostly. Um, <laughs> I have nothing against French people. Um, <laughs> Um, but if you, if you start like taking a, a, a sort of a bird eye view of the system, um, you will see that actually at this sort of large scale view of the system, things actually start to make sense. Everything that is very disorganized at the local systems start to organize itself at larger scales. And, and this idea that the, the organization of the 
colony emerges from these seemingly random interactions at the local level is what we call swarm intelligence. Um, the idea that we are all stupid as individuals and then when we start bumping into, into each other, something beautiful emerges out of it, though not always. We might talk about this after we fail a lot at it. I've heard you say swarm stupidity. Swarm stupidity is a real thing. Yeah, human beings have kind of swarm stupidity. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how like these little guys have what, like 300,000 neurons, something like this, mm -hmm. in this. Um, this is like something like 300,000 times less than us. Right. Have, like about 90 billion, yeah. give or take. Actually. And, and these guys are smarter and better at organizing their collective activities that we, with our big brains, are capable of doing. No, they're in a lot largely of situations. blind, right? Um, no, no, not, not most ants. There are some ants that are. And this interestingly, like coming off this idea of like having so few neurons and having these really complex behaviors, for a long time, um, neuroscientists had hypothesized like, what's the smallest you can make a brain? So it's this idea of brain miniaturization. But at some point, you can't have enough neurons in that area to actually do anything intelligent or you know, organized. And in all cases, ants break those rules. You can make mathematical models that tell you how small something should get and not be able to function, and yet you can have a highly organized ant colony that's able to pull it off. Is so no it individual has it, but as a colony as a whole, they do. Right, so each individual is myopic cognitively. No individual can see the whole organization, but they're like brain cells or neurons and collectively they form this organization. So I know, Corey, that you uh, showed that ants were much older um, as an animal than, do we call insects animals? I'm not good at my biology terminology. I just wanted to say that made me so proud because <laughs> I hate when people say that insects aren't animals, because they are. <laughs> and you showed that they are how old? So we believe that modern day ants are probably about 140 million years old. So that means that they were running around biting the toes of dinosaurs, watched them go extinct and continued on. Um, and they are both ecologically and numerically one of the most dominant groups of animals on the planet. How many species of ants are there? There are about 15,000 species that have names by scientists. Is but there any an animal with that many species? There are, beetles have a lot more, but there are more ants, beetles. more ant species than all the birds and mammals added together. Just ants. That's not talking about insects. Right. So I understand that they evolved from reading some of your work, um, along with flowering plants. So there's a real symbiosis between the ants and the plant matter, the vegetation that they were responding to. Have you ever heard that some ants, once they eat the enzymes of a certain tree, are compelled to protect that particular tree? Yes, I've actually worked on that group of ants. <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Um, so those are the acacia ants. So we haven't done the work on the physiology of diet and how that manipulates the hosts. But what we've done is we've done, gone in and done a whole bunch of genomic sequencing to understand how in, when you engage in an obligate mutualism, how it may shape your genome. So we've known for a long time that in, to engage in a mutualism, you probably have genes that change. So we know that your genome may change in relation to your behavior. But what we did is the flip. We showed how your behavior alters your genome. And we did that in that group of ants that actually had this obligate symbiosis with these plants. So in this case, the ants defend the plants from all herbivores, encroaching vegetation, pathogenic fungi, everything. And in return, those plants actually provide nesting space and food for the ants. So they never can live anywhere else except on those plants. And those plants have de-invested in all their kinds of defense, and they can only live with the ants. So we're going to talk about the superorganism of the ant colony, but we should, in the back of our minds, be thinking about the superorganism of the entire ecology, right? Because the genome is evolving, co-evolving together. So you can't talk about ants and not talk about eusociality, this idea of this altruistic social evolution, which seems to defy the kind of traditional Darwinian theory, which is reproduce, reproduce, reproduce. And in ant colonies, it's only the queen who reproduces. And all ants are social. Is that right? There are no solitary ants. So um, Eo Wilson, you can't also mention ants and not mention Eo, said that eusociality was one of the greatest innovations in the history of life. And he was your PhD advisor. Is that right? He was. He was one of my advisors. So what is so interesting about this altruism in terms of evolution. What's so odd about it? 
So I guess from the standpoint of <laughs> being an evolutionary <laughs> biologist, I mean, like the only reason we exist is to propel our genes into the next generation. That's the drive behind almost any organism, right? Now, whether we're sexual or asexual, what we want to do is to make sure our genes are around into the future. And in the case of eusocial organisms, what you have is most individuals defer the right to reproduce. So all those workers you saw running around in those videos cannot reproduce. Their only job is to help maintain the colony so that the queen can reproduce. All of those are sisters, and they're very genetically related. So in fact, by deferring reproduction and being all females, they're more highly genetically related to each other and the offspring that the queen lays than if they laid their eggs themselves. So um, this is fascinating. We're going to pick this up again. But I want to talk in terms of eusociality with Simone about this sense that they're architects. So here I have this from your lab. Um, these are ants forming a living bridge yes. across. Are those two leaves? And yeah, so where is this? So that's, that's my second favorite species of ants. <laughs> What's your favorite? Uh, the uh, weaver ants. <laughs> Come see, come saw. River no, ants? Come River ants? Are <laughs> the turtle ants are the best. You know ah, this. No, 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 We're no, getting no, to no, turtle no. ants. If you have a battle between the weaver ants and the turtle ants, I don't think you win. Oh, we would definitely oh, win. They're like little <laughs> tanks. It's going down. It's on. So, um, yeah, so these are, these are uh, army ants uh, of uh, genus Esiton that you find in the uh, tropical forest. You find this in Panama, Costa Rica, all of uh, the north of South America, you'll find them. Um, and they are, they are weird among the ants, right? Most ants live in they have their central nest and then they forage out of the nest. These guys actually, they don't have a central nest. They migrate every, almost every night. And um, their colony can be huge, like one, two million individual in, in some species. And so they have this massive, uh, you know, technological issues, which is how do you move um, one or two million people like the city of Philadelphia? I don't know if I should mention Philadelphia here, um, <laughs> or Chicago, um, every night, and you relocate it several miles away. So they move like two or 300 meters away from their previous location every night. And in order to manage this problem, Why yes, do they move every night, Simon? Why do they move every night? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, because they run out of food. Because they run out of food. That's, that's why we move all the time. Though we have a paper out showing that, they, you know, you've seen the paper with Danielle? No. No. I saw with the who? paper. <laughs> Daniel Kronauer. Oh, with Daniel. You know, this like yes. people's Daniel. lab there. Where's Daniel the, lab. Where's the, lab where's the Roosevelt York? University folk? Can you raise no, your hand? Rockefeller. Uh, what did I Rockefeller. say? Rockefeller. Rockefeller, sorry. Rockefeller University folk. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Rock. We're going to come back to you guys later. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, they have to move every night and to feed their larvae. Right? The larvae require a lot of food. And they are carnivorous, so they have to kill other insects. Um, they're not very nice. Uh, I mean, they call army ants for a reason, I guess. Um, and um, part of the challenge is to move this entire colony throughout this landscape as fast as possible to be able to rebuild an entire new temporary nest somewhere else every night. And they do this, um, they manage to do this as fast as they can by building these bridges that can be super long. Like yeah. we have uh, this a video recently broke the internet. This is very, very this long one, This chain. is fantastic. This um, is, but you set up. Yeah. Oh my God, what's happening? Look at the guys running yeah. around at the bottom. <laughs> um, so we so this is an example yet. of the experiments we do. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, so th this bridge has something maybe two or 300 ants all attached to each other. They're, everybody's alive in there, right? It's not, um, don't, don't be sad. Nobody dies in there, right? It's <laughs> and if they do, somebody takes them to the graveyard. Yeah. <laughs> no. They actually, they kill everything they find. That's the, they, they, they are so at the top of the food chain that they have parasites, they have birds following them that parasite these colonies, try to steal their food. Uh, so it's probably the only animal I know that's smaller than their parasites. And then they have a butterfly that follows the birds that can only eat the bird's poop. That's true. <laughs> so it's like parasite of parasite. It's like we'll talk about eating poop later, Corey. Hyperparasite. Yeah. But anyway, th th this structure that they form by just attaching to each other, uh, and, and they, these are blind, talking about blind ants, these are, are completely blind, um, that allow them to essentially um, sort of smooth out the terrain right in front of them, uh, build bridges on the, on the fly. This bridge forms in a few seconds, a matter of minutes, and as soon as traffic dies down, they dismantle and they go rebuild somewhere else. 
And this is something that, I mean, imagine that you have to cross the Hudson River, but you don't want to go all the way to the, you know, whatever bridge, the Washington Bridge, which is <laughs> famously. Uh, <laughs> walk on the backs of your friends. Yeah. Yeah, you just walk with all your friends and then you just form this bridge naturally across the river and then you go across very quickly. And you New Yorkers will appreciate this. If there's a pothole, one of them will lay down to block the pothole so the rest when they're running over, it's smooth terrain. Yeah, it's autom aut yeah, autom automatic pothole like fixing. So it's one amazing. Of, one of the things that's fascinating is how does a bridge form in the first place? So here comes an ant and it comes across and it's like on a leaf and it's teetering and then what happens? So it, it starts a traffic jam. So, yeah, so, so what happened, I mean, usually the gap is a lot smaller. That, that's an experiment. Yeah, we, have, we have one we of have these from you, too. Oh, yeah. These guys are fast. <laughs> well, no, that's 10 times I'm faster. I'm joking. It's, it's written here. <laughs> I saw um, the 10 times. Now, what, what's amazing, essentially, when the ants arrive on one side and they f find this gap, they will slow down. And so naturally, if you slow down and someone is coming full speed behind you, um, in ants, they don't stop. They will just walk over you. And that's how you start the bridge, essentially. If someone walks over you, yeah. you just stop there, and then you wait until... So the stop command is when somebody walks over your back. Yeah, that's So if somebody walks signal. over your back, like as an ant, you freeze. Yeah. And then if more walk over the backs of the next one, so they all start to freeze. And you notice, let's watch this one again, that when the bridge collapses, the ones at the bottom are no longer being walked on, so they start to no. climb back up. Yeah, I mean, they are. I mean, the, the, you they see the entire traffic climb. comes down and start forming yeah, this bubble. Yeah, they start to climb back up, so they reform then, the bridge yeah. naturally. Exactly. Yeah. So what happens when the bridge is reformed, that there's no more traffic feeding the structure at the bottom, and so the ants at the bottom are like, well, I mean, I, They're I'm like, oh, I can move yeah. now. Like, the stop command has ceased. So they're basically executing a really basic algorithm. Yeah, very basic. It's not that the ants are like computers. It's that they are computers, <laughs> right? It's basically a very simple computer algorithm. Yeah, stop, you, start, stop, start. You're going start. to upset a lot of people saying that. But <laughs> <laughs> Who's upset? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, because I mean, there's a lot we'll of cut it out of the video edition. <laughs> there, there are a lot of people who tell you that their their tiny brains can do a lot more fancy things than just uh, stopping and. But restarting. you don't believe that, or no, do I'm, you? What I'm or saying do is, you? no, I, I do believe that. I mean, the experiment is there to show us that some of these ends can learn to navigate very complex routes. They can use uh, the patterns of uh, polarized lights. Hmm? They, they, they can count. count. They can count their steps. Um, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing. What we say here is that uh, all this complexity in the behavior is not necessary to explain that collective action here. Right. And that's something that is true across all the work I do is that we're trying to look at, and it works also in human beings, is that a lot of the, these very large scale collective behaviors don't require mm -hmm. high computational power. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that this animal is not capable of doing mm -hmm. this. Can That's I my way of not upsetting Can a bunch I take of this pause while I'm about to shift to another subject to ask Gabriel to return my timepiece? Because <laughs> otherwise I c will go for hours. Your daughter called me twice. Oh, my daughter called me twice. Okay. <laughs> um, so as a pivot to the next sort of natural, I think, thinking about this is the allocation of tasks, right? Because it's not just that Maybe in this particular case, any ant stops and freezes on that command. But I know that, that Corey, you work a lot on, oh, actually, oh, sorry, I apologize. Simon, I wanted to still, <laughs> we're still on Simon. This is my <laughs> number one favorite species of ant. Which is, which one is this? That's, that's the uh, weaver ant. That's actually uh, an ant you find in northern Australia. It's and called, uh, is that a, what are they doing and what is that? So th they have this, uh, they are arboreal ants, they live in trees and they have this, um, Probably the coolest nest that you can find in. I mean, I, I don't know. What I you agree. Think. Yeah. Their nests are cool, but so Polly, Rake, what's Polly Rakus does the same thing. Hmm? What's so cool about the nest? <laughs> so the nest are uh, the nest are built out of leaves. So they essentially use they form these little chains and they can pull. Is that on a leaves. leaf? A pseudo leaf? That's a, that's an experimental leaf. Yeah. <laughs> experimental leaf. Um, and so they will bend these leaves and, 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 uh, and bring them together, and then they will use the, uh, the, the um, silk produced by the larvae, so they use the babies, essentially. Um, the babies poop out silk, and... So we poop it out, it's from the mouth. Yeah, oh yeah, they're right, it's from the mouth. <laughs> so they throw up, they throw up <laughs> the silk. That's why we have two scientists on stage. Yeah, I, I, need, I need to say that. She knows ants, I, I, I know complex systems. So everything that I say about ants, we need to double check with her. Everything she says about complex systems, you have to double check with me. No.
All right, you're better. <laughs> so anyway, they, they, they use the silk produced by the larvae to stitch, essentially. I mean, you see them, they literally weave these leaves together. They take the larvae and then they move it back and forth between the two fragments of the leaves. And this, this silk is extremely, extremely resistant. I mean, it's similar to uh, you know, spider silk, etc. cetera. And um, when, you go to the f when you go out and you find this, this nest, they look like fruits hanging from trees. Um, you cut them, you get, bring them back to the nest. That's the, the to colony. The, the colony looks like the fruit. Now the colony can be an entire tree. Actually, several trees can be a single oh. colony. And the colony will and be distributed sometimes across hundreds of nests. And you never know where the queen is going to be. Uh, you never know what you find. there's only one queen in um, that colony. Are they? Yes. In Ecofella, there's one queen. Yeah, okay. See? Double check. <laughs> Um, and, and if you try to open it up, uh, it, it is really, really hard material. And also, you better do this very quickly because they are probably the, some of the nastiest ants I know. Pissed <laughs> off. Hmm? They're going to be pissed off. They're extremely pissed off. Um, they have little sticky pad under their, fing their, their um, legs, which allow them to stick to you very um, easily. So you can't remove them by just like tapping. Most ants, if you have them on you, you just tap your hand and they fall. These guys, they won't. And then they have this very sharp mandibles and they will cut through and then they will use their gaster to project uh, formic acid into the He's little cut. He's doing well. <laughs> <laughs> because it happened to me many times. <laughs> <laughs> so I know this firsthand. Um, and they're, they're, really, uh, they're, really, uh, they're really nasty to work with but they are beautiful. They're beautiful and nasty which is what I, I like <laughs> in ants. Um, That's what you look for in an ant, yeah. And, and what, what's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not in people. Um, <laughs> I mean, beautiful, yeah, sometimes. But um, <laughs> um, stop there. Just keep going, Simon. <laughs> yes. But what's, what's amazing is really that they, they, they seem to be coordinating these folding behaviors um, without having anybody in charge. There's no architect in the colony that tell them that's you know pick here and then pull this way, etc. It is completely self-organizing, and yeah. I right. Mean, this is one of the things that we just glossed over, but it's really crucial to the um, ant social structure is that there's no central, uh, it's totally decentralized, there's no boss. We, I think that when I grew up, I thought, oh, the queen sent out commands, but this is completely fallacious. The, the queen gives birth to the new ants, but doesn't actually run the colony. And right. so that's fascinating that it seems totally decentralized. I actually think that the worst job in a nest is being the queen. <laughs> because, I, I mean, a queen, she essentially leaves the nest when she um, becomes fertile. Should we talk about ant sex now? Is sure, this the time? I love talking about <laughs> ant sex anytime. <laughs> she leaves the nest when she's fertile. So do males. The males will find a female. They'll copulate. Depending on the species of ant, sometimes she'll only copulate with one male, but usually she'll copulate with many. In army ants, it can be up to 40. And she'll store the sperm. She'll of then all 40? Of all 40 in a specialized structure called a spermatheca. And then she'll fly around to find a place to start a new nest. The males die right away. So the male's role in the colony is only reproduction. They never help build the nest. They never help defend the nest. They never help feed the young. They're just flying sperm sacks. That's so, it. So like in some human colonies, the males are only don't, good for Don't sex. read too much into this, though. <laughs> says the male. <laughs> and so once she's fertilized, she'll start a new colony. Depending on the species, she may never leave the ground again. So if she digs deep into the soil, all she becomes is an egg-laying machine. She never gets to see the sunlight again. She only has food regurgitated to her. So it's like the worst role. To me, if you want to be a cool ant, be a worker. <laughs> so um, you die fast, though. So let's talk about task allocation. So behind us, we have. I think. I think you like this one. Is this an army ant? I hope so. That's it, an it army. It is very much an yeah. army ant. <laughs> and and this is a soldier. And the soldiers are all the all the soldiers are female. Yeah. That's and right. All ants are female that you've ever seen. Yeah. Unless you've seen an ant with wings, it's probably female. And it, well, if it has a tiny So the butt. only ones that have wings are the sexuals, which are the males that are to reproduce and with the, the queen the and the well. queen. Yeah. And the so the queen queens. and the males fly out once a year, the virgin queens, and then the virgin queens drop their wings like some Disney nonsense <laughs> when they've lost. She actually like cut them, <laughs> like yeah, them so apart. It's quite violent. They like yeah, kind of yeah. cut them and they step on them and rip them off. Wow. 
So the males are only there to, to reproduce and then the males die. So That's all true. the ants, the workers, the soldiers, the maintenance crew. All female. The ones that carry you off to a graveyard, they're all female ants. So this is a female ant, soldier. Yep. And tell me about the mandibles on this one. So what you see here, this is a soldier army ant. Um, and these tusk-like structures are their mandibles. So their role in the colony is when they go out on these foraging raids is just to defend all the workers who are gathering the food and carrying them back. Sometimes they can help carve up food depending on how complex it is. Kind of like with the mango. Kind of like the mango. They would be terrible at a mango. Um, well, they don't care about mango these. <laughs> they don't care about mangoes because they're predatory. But in this case, all her job is is for you know, protecting the colony. And so because her jaws have become so elongated through natural selection, she can't even feed herself. She actually relies on other individuals from the nest who have regular shaped mandibles to come and bring food and put it in directly into her mouth. That's quite astounding. And they're little, little girls. They go. Yeah, they're really small. I mean, they're maybe like the size of your finger, your pinky fingernail. Um, but they're well, quite they, ferocious, and they yeah. have really painful stings. Um, yes, I, I know that from experience as well. So do I, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but the other thing that I think that's quite extraordinary about this group of ants is that this group of ants, as well as the old wool version of the same group of ants, that indigenous peoples had recognized that they could use these ants in medicine. So what they use is they actually use them for sutures. So if you get cut in the rainforest, you can actually use their mandibles. They're kind of like, it's a, you know, an yes. urban myth, but pit bulls that essentially once they bite down, they can't unlock, which is not true, but needless to say. In this case, you can get them to bite down and then you can essentially kill them by twisting off the rest of their body and you can use them as sutures and let your wound heal. If you don't believe this, just go on YouTube. There's actually <laughs> a tutorial on how to do this. <laughs> and there's actually old, um, beautiful photographs in National Geographic of indigenous people who had them still attached while their sutures were like healing. So tell me about this, gu this girl. Oh I was going to say See, guy. I told you turtle ants were the coolest ants. Look at that. <laughs> so this is another ants. species. So not all ants have soldiers. So many times what you have is a single size within a colony. But in some cases, you'll have these really dramatic evolutions of, of different sort of form. And this is a soldier. And so essentially, her, a soldier's role is always in that's beautiful. <laughs> a, a soldier's role is always in defense. And there's two kinds of defense. There's active defense, like those army ants with those big sickle-like mandibles. And there's passive defense, and that's what turtle ants do. So these essentially act as the gatekeepers, and they don't let any predators or parasites into the nest. They essentially stand inside the door. They live inside hollow twigs, and the nest entrance is exactly the size of their head and they block the nest entrance with their head. So they're just living doors. They just sit there all day long. <laughs> they're kind of like you know, your, your uh, driveway door. <laughs> and they only let in individuals that are from the exact same colony, which they recognize by pheromones or chemical communication. Now, so these tasks that are allocated to the different ants, um, what's fascinating is some of them are for life, but some of them are not. Is that right? So you can have a forager ant who's a forager ant their whole life, and then there's a maintenance ant that's a maintenance ant for their whole life up to a certain point, and then environmental influences induce them to switch roles. And so is that a form of epigenetics, meaning that they're not totally genetically determined, but the chemical influences change what genes express and what genes don't express? Something for the Rockefeller people. <laughs> we're coming, we're com they're in the next slide, let me see. Where are they? Oh, this is also from you, Simone. But we'll, we'll come to that. Oh, that's, we'll, we'll come to you guys, Rockefeller, Rockefeller people. Um, so. so it seems that when you have really specialized castes, things like soldiers, they never change jobs. As soon as they emerge as adults, they maintain the same jobs. Almost all workers essentially go through developmental changes as they age. And so E.O. Wilson once said that in ants, it's that we send our grandmothers to war, not our young men. And what that means is that since most of the, all of the workers are female, when a worker first emerges from the pupil stage, so it's kind of like a butterfly where you have an egg and then you have like a caterpillar form. In this case, they kind of look like fly maggots instead of beautiful caterpillars. Then they go through a pupil or a cocoon stage. Um, and then eventually they emerge as the adults. And once they look like an adult, they never grow again. But their tasks can change. So we have task allocation that changes through their development. So when they first emerge, they do the safe chores. They take care of the queen, they take care of the larvae. As they get a little older, they might clean the nest and build new tunnels. As they get a little older, they might start to sort of forage near the nest entrance. 
But eventually, as they get old enough, or older, grandmother age, then they start foraging outside of the nest. So one of the most fascinating things I heard recently was that ants don't make new ants. Colonies make new colonies. So when a colony starts, when the queen goes and drops her wings, if it's not an army ant that marches through the forest, but one that burrows in the ground, she'll, she'll find a spot, she'll start to burrow, she'll start to lay eggs and start a totally new colony. So you have a colony that starts with one ant, and that slowly grows. And when it reaches maturation, which might be a few years, when it reaches maybe 10,000 ants, it becomes mature enough to begin to reproduce. But the thing that stunned me about that is all the ants except the queen only live for a year. So when it matures to five years as a colony, none of those ants were part of the original colony. There's no memory. And since the queen is not conveying that, I mean, this totally blew me away, how does the colony know it's reached maturation and it's time to send out a new queen? I mean, that, that just is so emphasizing the concept of the super organism. It's as though the organism has reached puberty or maturation, the super organism and not the individuals. I would say from an evolutionary standpoint that it's no different than us, that it's all tied to nutrition, right? We know that many you know, human societies reach maturation or sexual maturity at different times and it's often related to how much nutrition you have in your environment or your community or your culture, um, which is why we're seeing girls reaching sexual maturity at much younger and younger ages, right? We're not in food sh shortage times anymore. But with an ant colony, once they get large enough that they can bring in enough food that there's not necessarily always a starving need of the larva, they can then start to feed them more and more, and those individuals can then become the sexuals. So um, the queen, however, can live for 20, 25 years, Depending using the, the sperm from that one mating. And you, uh, the, the females are fertilized, is that right? Not the workers. Oh, interesting. So wait, the males, are the males fertilized? The males, sorry. So the males deposit their sperm in the spermatheca of the yes. queen. Then the queen maintains all of that sperm. Yeah. But all those workers, all those ones foraging on the sidewalk or building bridges, none of them have the capacity to reproduce. So they're, but were they fertilized with sperm from the males? Oh, so we're talking about the weird, wonky sex life of ants. <laughs> <laughs> so... How many of you have done some kind of ancestry test? Oh, wow, way less of you than I expected. <laughs> Go on to 23andMe.com. Um, but if Did you've you ever done it, you know there? that if you're, no, I don't, oh. but I think it's an awesome model. But anyways, um, <laughs> but if you've ever done any of those ancestry tests, if you're a female, you know that you get much res less resolution than males because a lot of the markers are on the Y chromosome. And that's because we're diploid organisms, right? So the way that our sex is determined is because we either have an X and an X, female, or an X and a Y, and we become male. But in ants, it's totally different. The way that your sex is determined is to whether or not you're fertilized. So if a queen lays an egg, and she takes one of those sperm from the spermatheca and unites it with the egg, it becomes female. So females are diploid. Males, if a female lays an egg and doesn't let any sperm touch it, they become haploid. So males only have half the genome that the females have. So their sex is determined by the number of chromosomes they have. Um, so I just want to show this quickly um, before we shift topics, which is thank you to the Rockefeller crowd for providing this. This is from, uh, I'm going to, am I say this right? The Laboratory of Social Evolution and Behavior. How'd I do? All right. <laughs> um, thank you for allowing us to use this. This is uh, just a video about these ants that are grooming the larvae uh, uh, from the nest. And one of the things that they learned from this was that the insulin from the young was influencing whether or not they wanted to reproduce. So it was suppressing reproduction when they were grooming. Are you guys, why are you guys laughing? I mean, am I saying this totally wrong? No, I'm looking at I'm Seema. a physicist. Yeah, what do she's I know? Like, she, she wants me to answer this question knowing that I have no idea what I'm going to be talking about. Okay, well, I'm going to spare Simone and we're going to go to... I just think this is beautiful. This is just the fact that we're, you know, our children manipulate us is basically the punchline. Um, That's so true. here we're on to some bee porn. I, I couldn't... Um, I couldn't think of doing this topic and not talk about bees because everyone loves bees. Um, this is from the U.S. Uh, Geographical Society that they had these stunning um, 
portraits of, of bees. And uh, what I wanted to ask about here is that bees are not purely social. Is that right? Some bees are solitary. Yeah, I mean, among, among, among the ants, everybody is social to some extent. Mm -hmm. Among the bees, you find solitary species, um, like among the wasps as well, from which they are derived, if I believe. Yes. Uh -huh. Good point. <laughs> 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 uh. And so one of the things about bees is that they also display swarm behavior, so they'll send out people to prospect new homes, and then they'll vote, right? They vote on new homes. And, That's um, right, yeah. yeah. And, and one of the um, aspects that weighs into the vote is this idea that they're communicating, and I know, Simone, you think a lot about the AI context of this, and we'll talk about this more, but they communicate mostly with nearest neighbors with very simple rules. Is that right? Is that how they come to vote? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, you wanted to? No, go ahead. Okay, that's my specialty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. Um, no, so, I mean, li like in a lot of social insects, right, communication is, is rarely at very long distance. In the case of uh, honeybees, for instance, right, have you heard all of the dance of the honeybees? Who has never heard the of the dance? dance? The waggle dance? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm not going to do it here, but. I I'd like to, s I think we all need all to right. see him <laughs> demonstrate the waggle dance. <laughs> So what he's saying Excellent. is go to the flower four meters out to the left, and it has great nectar. Yeah, you're, <laughs> oh, your you're good. Language is oh, you're good. fluent. Um, yeah, so I mean, th this, this signal that they, this, they, they, they try to transmit through this dance is actually only perceived by just a few of the ants inside the colony. I mean, only the ants that are actually on what they call the dance floor for real, uh, and that are in contact directly with, the, uh, with that particular dancer. And so every time, this ant dance, it might recruit maybe 10, 20 ants uh, out of a, uh, at a time, so which is not a lot for one individual. But all of these ant, uh, bees, sorry, will go uh, explore the fruit source or the new nest, come back, and if they like it, they're going to recruit as well. And so that creates this sort of like positive feedback where if I recruit 10 people, then you recruit 10 people, and the 10 people recruit, they recruit 10 people, etc. It's kind of like lobbyists. Pioneer works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> sorry, that was synchronicity. That was. <laughs> Um, and that, that sort of positive feedback makes everyone aware of the best option or one of the best options that's available inside the, uh, in the environment. And then that triggers uh, all sorts of changing, changing the behavior of the colony. If it's looking for a new nest, they have this other signal called the piping, uh, piping signal that just prepare them for takeoff, et cetera, et cetera. So I understand that the evolution of this kind of communication happened independently across several different kinds of animals. And so why do you think, Simone, that the same kinds of simple rules would evolve independently in different areas of biology? Well, because they are simple. That's, <laughs> that's, 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 no, that's the, the, the reason, right? If something is simple and cheap to implement, this idea of I inform that person of something, she informed the next two, that inform the next two, et cetera, that sort of exponential explosion in, in information processing, um, doesn't require a lot of brains or a lot of complexity. And so you see this at all levels of um, biological organi uh, organization. I mean, bacteria do that as well. Yeah, Humans I've heard you say before it's just physics. At some level, I'm it just upset physical. a lot of people if I do that. <laughs> no, you, it's, we don't care who we upset. Well, it's, it's, okay, it's not just physics, right? It's a combination Everything's of just physics, Simon. Everything's just <laughs> physics. <laughs> you are an astrophysicist. I would think everything is just resources. I'd say physics, I'm not talking about resources. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, the, this, this idea that... <laughs> Jeez, she's we were friends before this thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the controversy part of the... Uh, I see. Um, this, this, this idea that uh, you can modify... If you modify two things, that modify two things, etc. cetera, uh, is something that is present in a pretty much every physical system. I mean, uh, you can see this chemical reactions where you put a little bit, one molecule that starts transforming two molecules that then catalyze the process, et cetera, and you have this explosion in the number of molecules that are transformed. Resources. Resources. Well, I mean, at some point, you're gonna run out of molecules to transform, that's well, true. I, I think and then the reaction stops. And then the reaction stops. Well, I but it's resources. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I think but this is, is a perfect introduction to slime. Slime <laughs> yes, you've all been waiting for the slime. You're going to have to shut up on this one. You know nothing about <laughs> slime, right? I can but pretend there are nobody <laughs> would know. 
Corey, Corey, um, just to, not to give it away, but there are resources. Those blobs are resources. <laughs> These are, this, this is all about resources, this one. So here's one of you. Tell me about your slime molds. These are molds. <laughs> these are not molds. They're not molds? They're and not they're mold. not slime. And they're not, well, they, I mean, yes. What are Have these? Have you touched them? It's pretty slimy. What do you call these? This, so it, this the particular blob. species, this blob, yeah, blob is a pretty good word, I think, to describe them, is uh, Physarum polycephalum. If my lab is demonstrating some of it at the back, if you want to bring this home, you can. <laughs> it's uh, cheap, it grows on pretty much anything. You could make a carpet out of it. You can make? Carpet. If you, if you have enough resources, you can make a carpet out of it. <laughs> I think the so thi this what's fascinating. So this is the size of a, a, a regular petri dish. So it's about like nine centimeters, ten centimeters diameter, uh, to give you a For sense of scale. For those of you who are not from Europe, it's like three inches. <laughs> I mean, you can be wrong. That's fine. <laughs> um, th this entire yellow mass that you're saying, right? It's one single cell which is absolutely fascinating to me, right? It's not multiple cells, it's not a multicellular organism, it's a unicellular organism um, that you can grow literally, I mean, I think the rec like a Japanese uh, researcher grows something like a, a square meter of it, um, and that's one cell. That's literally the biggest cell that you can ever uh, Very witness. few cells you could see with the naked eye. No, uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's one of the rare one with the, uh, the giant axon of the, like you find in, in some, uh, uh, What's the name of this thing in French, in English? Mm -hmm. Crabs and stuff like this. What? Anyway, let's forget <laughs> about this. We'll talk about it later. Let's just, let's just break amongst ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one single cell, though it is not just one single nucleus that's producing this. This is what we call a syncytium, so it's billions and billions of nuclei inside this cell. And you can start this entire cell from one nucleus, and then it will clone itself and clone itself and clone itself, but instead of separating into different cells, it will remain within the same cell body. So th this is food, these this three food. Yeah. points. And so what it's demonstrating is that it just explores until it finds food. So th this video was made because someone on TV wanted a pretty video. Um, <laughs> but uh, what you can see here is that the, the cell is not um, exploiting the environment equally, right? It's concentrating its, its biomass on the resource itself, and between the resources, it's building this network of uh, tubules, and then it uses this network of tubules to funnel nutrients and information from one part of the body to the other part of the body. So think of it as a gigantic, uh, as an end colony, but instead of having all the ends separated from each other, all the ends will be just one continuum. So it's solving math problems in some It's solving optimization problem, way. yes. Um, so I, I know that I saw some of your work when they were looking at, for instance, the Japanese metro system, that they could make a map of the Japanese metro, put food on the hubs, yeah put the slime mold, and the slime mold would do a pretty good job of solving the problem of where to put the train, train lines and the metro lines. Yeah, so what the slime mold will do is we'll build this network, and if you look at the properties of the network, so how well connected it is, so essentially how well, how easy it is to go from point A to point B in the network, and also how cheap it is to build, so how, f you can connect the network as much as you want, but that's gonna cost you a lot of money to build all the possible connections. And so you have this like optimal trade-off between trying to connect everything and, and optimize the speed at which you can go from A to B, and then trying to make it as cheap as possible. And so the slime is actually pretty good at balancing and finding this trade-off. Almost as good as a supercomputer. It is, I mean, what they found in this paper uh, by Nakagaki and his group is that it is very close to the optimal uh, solution that the engineers in Japan have found. It's just to let you know, the, net, the, the subway in New York is very far from that optimum. <laughs> <laughs> very, so very what's going on here? Yeah, so. It looks like a fractal. It looks like a fractal. Um, it's, uh, it, it is, I mean, to some extent, people have actually run the math on that. Uh, yeah, it seems like it's optimizing the outer periphery without maximizing the surface area, so. Yeah, so, so what, it, what you're seeing here is essentially exploring the environment it's trying to look for food, and when it finds nothing, it keeps essentially building up this finding out network. Essentially, it's maximizing the, the, the surface area of contact it can find with food. It's minimizing the amount of biomass that it leaves behind, and right. it maximizes this front to maximize essentially the, uh, the probability of encountering So you put no food in this dish? There's no food in this. So that was just cruel. Yes. That's just cruel, Simone. 
because it's really, it's really, you know, biologists are really, really nasty people. I know. I've seen Corey dissect ants with verve. <laughs> but you know what I think is really cool about this? Don't this what, actually really reminds this? me. Well, I'll get back to that. But this reminds me actually, when we go back to that idea of the army ants that are constantly nomadic and raiding and finding food in the environment, people have mapped out what their foraging like arenas look like, and it looks almost identical to this. So it looks identical to uh, Burchellii. Um, it would be different from Hemitum, for instance. So the, the amiants uh, form this, exactly, this sort of like front. If you go, if you're in a tropical forest, you see them, they come at you. I mean, not that fast, so you, you're fine, you survive. Um, but they maximize that sort of front to be able to uh, find resources. But it's actually, depending on the species you look at and depending on the type of uh, a prey they, they, they forage on. So a Birchidia is very sort of, they, they eat whatever they find. Yeah, eat anything. But you know. this speaks to the same idea that the um, social aspect or the superorganism aspect emerged independently several times and that the toolkit was limited by whatever forces there were on Earth to give you these simple sets of rules, which is an idea of an algorithm, right, which is the idea of a code. And we, we already discussed that maybe ant colonies aren't like computers, maybe they are computers. They're biological computers executing simple rules, as are the slime molds, which are not slime molds, you told me, but I can't pronounce the Latin name of the. But I also think it comes back to this idea of like who's actually in control. Like We like to think that there's somebody making decisions, and that it's so decentralized in these systems. And so just to put this in perspective, half of my work is actually on ant evolution. The other half is on all the microbes that live in and on them. And in, you know, one of, one of my PhD advisors, E.O. Wilson, once said that ants are the little things that run the world. I started studying the bacteria inside their guts, and now I think those are the little things that run the little things that run the world. <laughs> I actually think that a lot of the decision making by the host is driven by the needs of the microbes within them. And so, you know, it comes back to this idea of like, sort of scale. Like when you're looking at an entire rainforest from, you know, a LIDAR or from a helicopter or whatever, it looks really sophisticated and like complex. Then you get down in the forest and you might be looking at a single tree and trying to figure out sort of like what are those interactions that are driving what we're seeing all comes down to whether then you're on your hands and knees looking at the ants at the base of the tree. Now the ants and the microbes co-evolved. I mean, there was, do they actually swap genes between them sometimes? Is there an actual suppression of genes in bacteria or on the basis of the host? I mean, in what sense, how strongly correlated is the evolution of the different species? So it depends on the group of microbes. It depends on their sort of interaction with the host. So if they're parasitic on the host, they're gonna try to maintain all of the genes they need to be free living in those moments when the host has essentially kicked them out. Um, but for things that have become obligate with the host, so they're found nowhere else except inside us. Like in our stomachs. Exactly, and ants have the same thing within their stomachs. Not all ants. Um, but what we see is that those bacteria start losing all the genes they need to be free living because it's costly to maintain genes you don't need. So you only maintain the ones you need to live in the host, and then you often will then sort of take on new functions or upregulate functions that are beneficial to the host because then the host is also shuttling resources to you. So in the case of lots of bacteria that live inside the guts of ants, they've lost all of the genes they need to be free living, but they've kept all the genes they need to synthesize the essential amino acids that all animals need. And the ants that have maintained this mutualism are all herbivorous or vegetarians. So since they don't get all the environments they need in the, you know, they don't get all the nutrients they need in the environment, they let their bacteria upregulate their diet. But that means now they have access to resources and habitats that lots of other things can't live in. So vegetarianism is a result of symbiosis in some sense. At least in ants. <laughs> Maybe not in humans. We're gonna um, talk about this idea of the algorithm being translated uh, as a means of watching the ant social behavior or the bee social behavior or, or swarm intelligence to microbots. This I borrowed from a group at Harvard. These are little tiny microbots, yeah, right? It's a thousand. You can see some of them. Yes, you the can see some from Simone's group back here operating as a swarm. So there is no central intelligence here, there's no centralized no. boss here. They have a certain algorithm that they're taught, which is simple rules between your neighbors, mm -hmm. and then they execute those rules and they self-organize. Yes, yeah, so these are probably the most boring robots you'll ever see in your life. <laughs> Aren't uh, they like the ones that oh. sweep your floors? 
they're is even more boring like than that. that. Just more boring than that? Yeah, they do nothing, right? Like if you take a single one of these robots, you put it on the table, all it does is just randomly vibrate and move around and sometimes turns a little bit. Uh, they have like one light that they can turn on and off. That's, you know, fun for five minutes, but then it gets old. <laughs> uh, but what's fascinating with these robots is like they're so boring by themselves. They do so little by themselves, but then if you put them together and you give them these very simple interaction rules, I don't know if you're going to show that video. I was going to show this one where yeah. they make a starfish. This is, this is one of my favorite robotics video of all times. <laughs> all of this, they are forming, this is not like a reverse video. This, this shape is being built by the robots as they go, exclusively made, uh, exclusively based on, on rules that they execute from local information. They have no idea that they're actually forming this shape. None of the robots knows what it's doing. So it just has rules between neighbors, yeah, just a couple neighbors. of simple rules. It's like, if I have like two neighbors here, maybe I stop. If I have only one, then I don't stop, something like this. Mm -hmm. And so they have no idea what the shape uh, is going to look like, but just based on these simple uh, rules that are designed to, in this particular case, achieve this particular shape, mm -hmm. um, you can guarantee that you'll get a sh sort of like a starfish looking object in this case. But then isn't it mm? an exaggeration? This is not France. I know, <laughs> I know, Christophe, you really love your country. But. Um, I love this next one even more than you love the last one because what it, it drove home was the idea that if you had these little microbots, you could use them like a 3D printer. Yeah. This one's going to make a wrench. But here I am, let's say I'm on Mars and all I have is a thousand microbots. I can make a wrench and then I need a pliers. I can make pliers. I mean, obviously, this is very crude, but that's the ultimate ambition. Right, yeah, that, that they that become like a 3D printer. That, that is the idea behind uh, the concept of self-assembly. Right? Like that's what the Armians were doing before. They self-assemble into a bridge. They self-assemble into a nest. They build a structure, a 3D structure that is a function, that achieve a function for the colony, or in this case, maybe achieve a function for us. Um, but without even knowing that they are achieving that function, or they don't need to know that they are achieving that function, and they don't need to know the that the rules they're following are actually reaching that particular uh, uh, result in the so end. So here's where I take issue with the concept of, um, of, of this kind of swarm intelligence being an intelligence or being a model for AI, because it seems to me that they're just like rudimentary code. I mean, this is just rudimentary code. I can write rudimentary code that has a few simple rules that will draw this as well. And that's no, nowhere near what we think of as artificial intelligence, as in the Turing test, being able to convince me of consciousness. So it seems to be an enormous, so that's enormous why gulf between these very simple near neighbor rules, algorithms, codes, and consciousness. Like the mystery of qualia, the right? Mystery of what? Qualia, you oh. know, the sense of experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with you, right? Like I do not explain consciousness out of this. Now, I, and I don't also use the word intelligence very often. I prefer <laughs> to use the word problem solving. Uh -huh. What this structure, what these rules have been designed for in this case, or sometimes evolved for, is to solve a problem that the colony has or uh -huh. the group has. Um, mm -hmm. In the case of you know the army ants again, they need to be able to go across m an unknown landscape and they don't know what it's going to look like and so they have evolved these rules to be able to go across this landscape as fast as possible and solve that problem. Um, how that translates into the concept of intelligence and how we, we, we you know, become conscious of our own beings, it's a very different idea. Now I'm not against the idea of that being the basis for all form of intelligence in the end, right? Like if you think of your brain, you have 90 billion or 100 billion neurons because you're a very smart person. Um, I have the higher, the higher number. You have Thank lot you, more Simon. Than Thank me. you. A lot I'm more flattered. neurons than me. <laughs> um, but all these neurons, like individually, a, a single neuron, if you isolate it, put it on a petri dish, it does nothing. It is completely s useless. It mm. becomes only useful if it is in interactions with all the other neurons around it. And what's the, the I think the biggest step between what we see here and what's happening in here is that one of our neurons here can interact with 10,000 different neurons, right? Like it has a lot more connections with uh, larger populations uh, than the ants. An ants is going to be in interaction with 10 different ants at any time in average. Our brains is, each neuron is processing 10,000 different um, sources of information at once. And that, if you, if, if you simulate that, right, it l gives you a level of complexity that might be, I'm going to might with like big M, right, uh, the source for all Oh, oh, oh. So you think it might just be large numbers. What do you think, Corey? 
I think it's large numbers of years, meaning like all of the behaviors and structures that we see in nature are shaped by natural selection, right? And that has to do with the environment in which they evolved and initially, all of the selective pressures that have shaped them through the millions of years that we see them now, and what it is that their role in an ecosystem is and how they're obtaining those resources. So for something like an army ant, um, we might see that they're really good at problem solving how to scavenge large areas or explore large areas to find resources rapidly, where another closely related group of ants may have a totally different behavior but still can obtain the same number of resources in the same environment. And so for me, it's all about thinking how natural selection has shaped those populations. And so I might just take a step back and do a, a refresher on what natural selection is or evolution. And that's essentially that the aspects of an organism's biology that helps them succeed in the environment in which they're in at that moment ensures that their genes will pass on to the next generation. So it's almost like the genes have the longevity not the vehicle for the genes. It's like the genes are the ones that are nearly immortal. I'm not, not going the into that debate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say I yes. don't want to derail I mean, you. I like the primer. I like the primer on evolution. Sorry. Keep no, going. No, but I, I think that that's the thing that we often forget and that we often say, so people will say like, oh, well, you know, it's optimally evolved and that, you know, that was, you know, perfect for that organism and that's why we see it today. And it's like, no, no, no. Some of it's chance. Some of it's that that might have been really positive in that prior environment, and it's now costly now in the current environment, and that might be dropping in abundance, but we're only looking at a snapshot of time. Yeah, but I, I think, I mean, if we talk about artificial intelligence, all these things, I think this idea like, of the optimal behavior, right, it's, it, it is something, that, I mean, I blame computer science. It's context science. dependent. Yeah, no, but I blame That's computer science is. for that, where you, you, you have an objective function and you try to maximize that objective function, but in nature, the objective function is constantly changing. We will chasing a moving target, and sometimes, like, the target was here, and what we have evolved to reach that moving target, actually, when the target moves here, is extremely bad for us, and we can't actually evolve. And extinction. And so we extin yeah. Before we open it up to questions, I, I do want to ask about us. I mean, we can compare maybe maybe very loosely, maybe a very sketchy analogy, but individual ants in the superorganism to individual neurons in the brain. And yet, I don't know, do you believe that the superorganism has consciousness or, or, or at what stage, how does it emerge? I mean, it is a real perplexing question. Why do we develop a sense of self? Does the colony have a sense of self? Does a, does a colony think, oh, I'm coming of age, I'm ready for puberty, I'm ready to reproduce, the way we do as the collective of the individual neurons? And, like, and why would it be different if it is different? I guess there's two things, right? There's the, the, the anthropomorphizing of what we see, right? Like when we see the colony coming of age, right? We think of it like what, how we interpret it. Are we us. anthropomorphizing or are we making a weird, Map, but the question from is always that, right? It's like if you see, we, we, more complex system. when we look at animal behavior or behavior in general, right? You're looking at the output of a lot of processing and a lot of random noise sometimes, and then uh, we need to categorize it, right? We, otherwise, we can't make hypotheses and we can't right. move forward with the science. And sometimes, yeah, we're going to say the colony has matured because we see that they are reproduct reproductive individuals, and then we say, like, from that point on, the colony is mature, but actually what's happening in the colony is still at this point, there's still maturation process that are happening, I mean, constantly maturation process are happening in the colony. Um, and there's a lot of experiment that you can, you know, you remove part of the colony, you remove some types of workers, and in some colonies they will be able to replace this particular, you know, the nurses, for instance, um, but in some colonies they seem to be not, not capable of doing that. Well, anymore. maybe I can ask the question a different way um, for Corey, which is do you think that we are a version of a swarm intelligence? as a human being that has a notion of a self? I would say that most organisms don't have a sense of self in the same way that we do. Again, define sense of self, because uh, your a colony, for instance, knows this is not from uh, my colony. This right, other guy is not from, oh, girl. Coming back to your analogies, it's simple rules. You don't have the right chemical smells on you, so you're not of me. And that's different than saying, like, do I look beautiful in the mirror today? Am I going to be popular on social media? How is my profile? Like that's that very tastes different delicious. <laughs> Even that is like I, I a think group. lots of things know taste delicious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, bad I don't example. think you need to be intelligent <laughs> to know that one. <laughs> but I, I think that the way that we see self-organizing organisms or systems 
is not the same as humans. Now, there are a lot of analogies. There's a lot of things that we can learn from them, for sure. We know how to optimize lots of things in our lives by watching how social organisms have problem solved. But again, it's because they're learning from millions of years of evolution. We're learning from like, you know, what, 300,000 years of evolution? That's nothing, it's a snapshot, it's a Unless snap. it's a natural progression from the ants that are 150 million years old. Well, but ants are 150 million years old, humans are not. Right, but I mean the, the, the social organization or the complexity of the social organization. But social complexity has evolved multiple times independently. The toolkit. <laughs> right. And that's the thing that I think is interesting is where are the similarities and where are the differences? Mm -hmm. And you know, oftentimes I, you know, there's all of these analogies to why how ants are so industrialist and how like they're so efficient at things and there's even like proverbs in the Bible about how we should all be like ants. Um, but then the ants do a lot of really terrible things like feed on their own young, some species do. Like I would not advocate for that, like eat your babies in times of harsh resources, right? I mean, you know, I, mean, the, I think it's tasty. A, <laughs> We'll have to trust Simone. He looks. Apparently, and you don't have to be intelligent to know that they're learned. tasty. <laughs> I eat anything, so. He's French. <laughs> My husband's French, and he eats everything, so I know this is true. <laughs> but I think that you know we we want to connect with nature, and we want to connect with the outside world, and so we want to see the similarities, and we want to borrow from them. But we have to remember that they're sometimes due to shared evolutionary history. Mostly, it's due to what we call convergence. So we've landed at similar things, but from very different backgrounds. I mean, that's also kind of fascinating if we're singular as conscious, obviously not just humans, I mean, certain conscious mammals. If we're singular on the evolutionary tree and if it's a failed experiment or a successful experiment. And one of the things that interests me about the AI being based on these very simple al algorithmic rules is that even if they're very successful as a form of artificial intelligence, it's not what we would call intelligence by the Turing test sense, but still um, that would be a zombie in the sense that we consider, right? It would be something without consciousness, without qualia, without um, codes of behavior, without intention. And so that's one of the things that AI people are terrified of, right? They're, they're, they're the fear mongers are you in terrified? AI. I am terrified all, all the time. <laughs> that's because I'm French. Um, so I, I want to say two things about like the field of AI, right? Like, and, and again, this idea of complexity. If you look at the beginning of like the, seven, like the 70s or 80s, when we started looking at the uh, Ebb uh, synapse, et cetera, and doing the first computer models of a synapse and a neuron, um, these very simple model we're capable of um, doing like basic decision making or, or, or that's very much like the ant colony yeah um, but we, we have we are at the stage now where, where these AI still using the same general principles from you know 20 30 40 years ago are now multiplying the layers of connections making the, the this artificial neurons more and more uh, connected and what we see is now we, we are AI that are capable of recognizing you in a crowd Right, they, uh, they, can, they can detect your face and recognize your face and categorize objects in a completely uh, uh, automated matter, m manner. And but that's all based on having lots of data, which is just like what, evolution what are we through natural selection. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not saying so. There, there's actually a, an, a, a, an entire field that is telling you that learning processes and evolutionary processes mathematically are exactly the same things, right? You have something, you, you have a material that can accumulate uh, information or that can retain some form of information and then this material is iterated over and over and over until it reaches a sort of steady efficient state so it's what the brain's doing right where we get information we learn uh, if you do something bad you get punished you know that you should not do it again you do it again because you know that's me I'm stupid <laughs> and uh, but I learn little by little by essentially having a sort of substrate that is accumulating this information and then removing all the information that is making me do the wrong decision. And evolution works exactly in the same way. So quick, quick reply, Corey, and then I want to open it up to questions. Do you have a quick reply? Are you conceding one no, point? No, no, I just agree, I just say agree I'm not with her. I think, I'm <laughs> I think I won that one. <laughs> no. I, I think I, what I, I'm I saying was, I was is never in disagreement with in you. In AI, what we're often seeing is that if we feed enough data, so if we've shown enough kinds of face shapes and eye shapes and skin colors Right, and but freckles, that involves human beings to feed the data. Yeah. Right. So then we feed it enough data, then we can actually make something that can recognize variation. And that's what it's natural selection It's very different does. than a child. A child can 
doesn't need to be fed the data. The child will experience the data. No, but think, of, think so about that's it. Like where we're, we're, talking, we're talking about the AI right now is at the stage, it's like not even an end yet. Yeah. It's not even smart as an end. Yeah. Give it, I don't know how long, right? And reach this level where we can simulate right. 90 billion neurons interacting each other with 10,000 Learning of their peers. algorithms, yeah. You don't know what's going to happen then. So I could talk to you guys all night and I'm going to, <laughs> but not on stage. Okay. <laughs> so um, so I now think we have this to talk to them. Yes, I want to oh. thank our guests for being such good sports before we open it up to questions.